Okay, I think I would probably get going here a bit. I'll let Eva and Dan sort of take over and introduce it. I, I would ask that you you put your mics. We've got this. We're gonna have a lot of people on this probably. We should have done it as a webinar. We didn't. So do put your phones on mute if you could. Um, and uh, we did this sort of ad hoc uh, because we've been playing with uh, Chat GPT in a bunch of different ways. So I thought that maybe we would share it with everybody else and see how you want to use it and you take the fear of it away and then what i would ask is is that if you do fool with this and share it with your family and and learn some things that you uh share it back with us to understand how how the tool can be worked i uh, i this isn't a my use of gpt reminds me a little bit of netscape back in maybe 1992 when i first downloaded it i get this so it sort of changed from there i think it was probably 92 maybe my memory's off but moving from IRC to Netscape uh, browsers was sort of a big shift in how you use the web. Uh, so this does make AI a little bit more usable. But with that, I will turn it. If there are any questions before we dive in, we, we will record this. We will share it so you can share it with other people. And there's nothing proprietary here. Um, so please do share it. Uh, but with that, Eva, you want to take over and share? Yeah, welcome everybody. My name's Eva Tucker. I'm the director of marketing here at iSelect. Um, we have been playing around with ChatGPT since it was released in, in uh, end of November. I think it was November 30th. Um, we're, we've been nerding out over it, really excited, uh, experimenting with different use cases. Um, but prior to that, we've also been working on our own tool that uses the same underlying technology. There'll probably be more coming on that um, in the new year. Um, we set up this meeting uh, for our internal employees to, to explore ways that we might use it to make our jobs more efficient. Um, but it's it sort of evolved from there. We've opened it up to our broader network. Um, and so we're excited to have you all here. Um, please feel free to use the chat, introduce yourself, comment. Um, if you need anything during the webinar, you can send me a message and I will try to help. Um, and we have Dan Maycox going to be leading us today. Um, so with that, I will turn it on over to Dan. Terrific. My name is Dan Maycock. I'm a principal and co-founder of Loftus Labs. We do data consulting for the ag industry and have been with iSelect as a technical advisor for about three years now. Uh, so appreciate the opportunity to chat with everyone today. What I think will be a very disruptive technology. You know, I was talking to Carter yesterday and really thinking about all the advances industrial revolution had uh, to move a lot of things forward. You know, it went from cooking things in a fireplace in a pot to everyone having access to a stove. But by everyone having access to the stove, you know, what evolved because of that? And I think we're in very much of a knowledge revolution now where tools like AI uh, have been around for a while, but are now becoming more accessible. Uh, so even though chat GPT, some might think is just a chat bot, the technology it's built on and what allows it to do is very transformational, not just because it's so advanced, but because it's so accessible. Um, five million people, I think, got onto the service in the first five days, which is a record for anyone adopting anything over a period of time. So it's pretty um, exciting to say if we're in this knowledge revolution over the next five, six years, how can we start to build things on top of this platform? How can we start to build solutions and tools that take advantage of this technology? Now that we're seeing AI, very advanced AI go more mainstream. <clears throat> so what is ChatGPT? Um, it stands for Chat Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. I guess it's why they use GPT instead of putting all that out. It's essentially a chatbot that sits on GPT 3.5, which is a large language model. Um, and that uses a whole bunch of sophisticated deep learning techniques over a large corpus to basically make it uh, human-like in its response. I used to run Alexa Analytics at Amazon for a while, and I can tell you this far exceeds what we always tried to do uh, at Amazon, being able to make things that actually have conversations and can interpret things in intelligent ways and respond back. So what I have is kind of prepared as a whole bunch of examples of how this tool gets used. I'm hoping to get through this in a decent amount of time so we can jump in and start to get suggestions from the audience and trying stuff out. And uh, the beautiful part about this, want to make this as interactive as possible, but started with a number of examples to demonstrate the versatility of this tool. 
um, and everything from interpreting large text to summarizing to writing songs in the spirit of uh, the Beatles. So if you have any questions, though, feel free to um, speak up, but I'm happy to stop or go slower. And with that, I will share out my screen. So anyone can go to chat.openai.com, sign up for an account, which is totally free, uh, and you're set with this prompt. Uh, there's a bunch of examples of questions you could ask, but essentially you're just typing things here at the bottom. So uh, one example of what I started with is I took the first act from Hamlet, I posted it in here, and I simply asked ChatGPT, summarize the conversation below. And I thought this is a great way if you have text um, from chat transcripts and Zooms, but it's written in Shakespearean prose to be able to go through, paste all that in, in about 30 seconds, it took that summarize what it was um the paragraph was about but then i wasn't satisfied with that so i asked it to translate it into a poem um but then i said hey this is great can you write a sales pitch for me so not only did it take uh in a very quick time and summarize the first act of hamlet turned it into a poem for me um but then of course if i wanted to turn this around and email to someone here's the elsinore experience that i could pop into an email and this really demonstrates the fact that it's not um, simply going and creating things or summarizing things, um, but it's actually getting creative and interpreting things for me and also putting things in different formats. So oftentimes someone sends you an article you don't have time to read. Um, you're getting into a situation where you need to be able to come up with something witty. This takes away the blank page. A lot of this sometimes is going to seem hokey at times. Um, but having 70% of the work already done for you um, or 30% of the work done for you is a great start. And so from a sales context, what kind of things could you generate based on copying and pasting in a long note, a long text message, um, a chat transcript in Zoom, you weren't able to attend the meeting, simply pasting it in and then being able to turn it into different formats. A more practical example of that, I want to write someone about high blood pressure. So I get into a high tech solution for lowering blood pressure. I need five subject lines because I'm about to send someone a note. It's able to do that for me, but you know, I don't quite like the way the message is working. So I asked it to incorporate language around innovation. It's then going to take these headers for me and revise it to include the word innovation. So it hits it up a little bit, but I'm a startup. So I need to be able to rewrite these subject lines in a way that actually incorporates a startup name. So it's gonna take those, rewrite it for me. Uh, I don't really like the thought of high blood pressure. So let's change those and make it something focused around heart disease management. Taking the same language is gonna revise it and focus on heart disease management and heart health instead. But I really want it to be about the targeted focus around modern technology and heart management. So it's gonna rewrite them once again to incorporate language around that. And then I finally want to take that first header, but I want to write an email to startup founders. So it's going to take the first one here and generate a message for me based on that information. And I now have a start of an email thread on a subject line to talk about modern technology and heart disease management. And this was me not necessarily coming up with anything myself other than prompting, I need five headers and being able to refine it and revise it from there. An internal use um, around Slack. Uh, we use Slack internally. Um, a bunch of folks do. I need a policy for appropriately using Slack in the workplace. It wrote out this policy for me, but you know, I work at a venture capital company, so I needed something that's going to be focused more around the types of information that I might care about at a VC firm specifically. It's not necessarily specific enough to what I need for it. Just added the words venture capital, pretty much. So then I want to know what kinds of communication requirements are there for investment companies, confidentiality, professionalism, clarity, timeliness, attention to detail. You can regenerate this and get a bunch of different answers. But I like these five points in particular. So I said, take the policy you wrote for me, apply these five points to it, and give me something more tailored to my company itself, which it ended up doing is taking those five points with what it had written previously and rewrote it for me. I thought that was so great. So I got really excited and said, cool, 
Now I write the Python code that connects to Slack API, which allows me to modify settings based on the new policy. And if I want to go in now and take that policy, here's the Python code I would write and install in order to get Slack to respond to these policy changes. So not only can it be versatile in language, it can also work in areas like programming. Now I wanted to get really creative and have it write a story for me. Um, a lot of people are talking about writing children's books and other types of work there. So I had it write a 500 story about Robert, Robert the robot overcoming adversity in his home planet, populated by robots, several attempts of losing but winning every time, uh, winning in the end, um, winning the hearts of robot members on his planet, remember throughout history as being a winner despite several losses. And in no time at all, it wrote my 500 word story, winning on the robot Olympics. But of course, I wasn't content with that. So I had it change the story to winning the robot Olympics, which happens every four years, but he specifically won robot hacking competition. So it rewrote the entire story for me, incorporating that detail. Now I wanted it to write a song in the style of the Beatles based on the story. So now I have a song about Robert the Robot written in a similar prose and vernacular, uh, which lines to a Beatles song, which was great. But now I wanted a haiku poem. Uh, it did that for me. Really, though, I really wanted a Shakespearean sonnet based on that story, which it ended up doing in the end for me. So I'm not only able to have it generate a story, but take that story in whatever format I want in order to make it as useful as possible, as well as revising the story until it gets it right. And that really is the, the most impressive thing about this tool is not a one and done search prompt or something where I can type in a note just once. I can continue having a conversation about this, uh, saves it on the left side and caches it as many times as I want to. Um, so I'm gonna stop it here and allow people to ask, what else do you want me to ask chat GPT about Robert the Robot? Does anyone have any creative suggestions? Anything at all. Hey, Dan. Yes. Nice to see you, Chris Greenwell. Nice um, to see you. Yeah. Um, could you, I guess this is blowing my mind. Could you ask uh, the, the robot to write a program for you that would help you, I, I guess, search the world wide web for lost Bitcoin keys, for example? I don't know about that necessarily. The way this works is it's trained on a certain corpus. I think it was two or three years ago. It was incredibly spendy to train it. So it's not necessarily going to do things connected to the web. Um, it's not active and live. This doesn't learn. So something that happened in the news yesterday, uh, chat GPT would not know anything about. Um, it would only be up to, you know, what who is the current president, for example, Um that that's going to be Biden, but you know, in 24, you know, they're not necessarily going to retrain it on who the new president is. I so believe it's, it said it's trained to up till 2021. Okay. So it was uh, trained through last year and they don't necessarily retrain it as it's incredibly expensive to cover that much corpus, to keep it up to date. So it's cost prohibitive. Um, but for anything that it does know, obviously, you know, you can ask it pretty much anything to do. And Chris, to add to your point though, I've asked it to do things like, it's not always right, I should say. Like I asked it to give me a list of all the iSelect employees and it confidently gave me a list of names that I've never heard of. So yep. um, as far as, and, and that would be kind of a, a searching the web type capability. Um, and it, it failed that test on my end. But if you give it a list of iSelect employees and say, count the number of names that start with A or abbreviate everyone's names to first initial, first name, last name. It can do that kind of work. So it can manipulate things you post into it. And I wanna give you an example of that. Um, I went through an article on precision irrigation because we all are super excited about pivot irrigation, right? And what I did here is I went to this article, I hit edit, select all, I hit edit copy. I didn't even bother just copying the article, literally just the whole website. And I pasted the whole thing in here. And I said, summarize this article into five sentences for me. So this article was just, you know, me copying and pasting this website, 
right into here and on and on and on. And here's the summary of that article in five sentences. Uh, so I can quickly scan through that. And then I once again had it write this summary into a body of an email. So I can take this article into something I can send out to people. It does that for me. But I'm confused as to pivot irrigation and why that matters to crops. So I can then ask it contextual questions. I can say, what does this article have to do with crops? It takes the question, applies it to the article, and relates it back to why this is important for me as someone that cares about crops. And I got like, so excited about that, asked it to write a sales pitch for me, which it did. And now that I have the sales pitch and I have the email and I understand the context, well, of course, I need tweets. So I asked it to write five tweets based on the article, and it even generated hashtags for me. So I now have five tweets to post out my summary. I have an email to send out to people, all based on an article someone sent me that I didn't necessarily have time to go through and do all this myself. And I think about my work in marketing, the amount of time it would take me to not only write a good summary, generate an email, contextualize it to what I do, but then generate tweets to do it. This all took less than a minute to do. And so in any context, I take information and I synthesize that through. It's even throwing in the hashtags for me. And that's the beautiful part about this. And once I said, is it's so much further than just me having a conversation. Even if I have to go through and tweak these, 70% of it's done for me. Is there any way, is there any way to get ChatGBT to check the validity or the, you know, because the scenario that you just just put there, let's say this article that you dropped into chat GPT is a complete piece of propaganda. And, and then you've been able to, to create a secondary piece to pump that up. Um, so is there any way that chat GPT can do critical analysis with, like, with respect to validity of the content that it's being fed? So that's where uh, it can't necessarily do any kind of checking because it doesn't have a context of what is valid. It simply takes what it's given and interprets it. Um, it's more of a reasoning engine than it is validity. However, what I've found is <clears throat> with these summaries, um, I can quickly distill an article into the main points. And if the summary doesn't make sense, there's a good chance there's nonsense in the article itself. So it's still relying on me to be able to vet this. And the reason why I thought it was important to say, relate it back to our agriculture is if I'm not necessarily an ag expert, this might be a really cool article, but I want to know what it has to do with actually growing crops. And does this make sense to me? And, but this is something I could also paste and send to an agronomist to say, Hey, I'm interested in pivot irrigation. Does this make sense to you? And being able to fact check it because it will write nonsense. Um, it is no, it isn't as nonsense, but your great point around the validity of this article itself. You know, this is something I selected, but between the summary I'm reading, the context it'll provide and what I'm sending, you know, that's something that definitely has to be vetted and it requires an expert to do it. Another example is I wanted to write a Python just, program. Uh, Dan, just to add something to that. Um, I found that because I end up writing a lot of original content, what I what I found is that it helps me um, narrow my thoughts a little bit. So if I'm writing content and I'm bringing up five other issues that are sort of ancillary, but really really don't matter, if I push it back through GPT, it it sort of catches that and says, you know, that really doesn't reinforce your point very well in a sense, and comes back with a summary. So I would say that as a productivity tool. I find it very helpful. One that's language model helps make sure it has a general understanding of the content, of the context of the overall subject. And then when you write something and you give it to it, it it tends to narrow it a little bit so that other people can read it without sort of saying, "What you know, this is a really long article that's going off into the end of the wilderness. So I'd, I find that helpful from a productivity standpoint. It's a great way to put it. And another example of that is, um... I want to know the best path for pipes in my aquaponics facility. So I want to write a, write a Python program to figure that out. Um, if anyone has- We are getting more program. insight into Dan's brain in this process. Exactly. <laughs> yes. The types of things I sit up asking it all night. Um, and the interesting thing is, 
It gave me a algorithm I should use in order to figure out the best path for pipes using a graph search algorithm um, in order to do that. The Python code isn't going to be flawless, but the fact that it knows the right algorithms to use to figure this out doesn't know anything about aquaponics necessarily, but it does say the best path for pipes is simply optimizing points, two points between A and B. It does know enough to know shortest path between tanks and plants, so it has some context and awareness there. But the Python isn't necessarily going to be spot on, but boy, does this save me a bunch of time trying to figure out not necessarily how to write Python, but what's the best Python to write. So this might have to be vetted. This might have to be changed, but the fact that I got here so quickly is the mind-blowing part, is it can not only contextualize the fastest path between two points, Python and what aquaponics is, but combine it all in a relatively short period of time. It, this way it acts as a second brain. Still not something that's a silver bullet. Still, I need to know, um, you know, what aquaponics is and how to program Python. But the fact that I got this far is pretty amazing. Another example, though, if I knew nothing about it, explain quantum electrodynamics to me like I'm a five-year-old. QED, uh, something Richard Feynman wrote a book about. Um, this is a famous topic because he wrote all his books so his wife, an English teacher, could understand it. But now if I'm stuck with something complex, um, it basically spit out a complex topic that I knew nothing about to educate myself for areas that I do want to know. I got it to something where anyone could read and understand complex mathematical topics, physical topics. Um, we'll get into agriculture here. What's a mathematical equation to calculate evapotranspiration for my apple tree? Then build an irrigation schedule for seven days based on that equation. Evapotranspiration is the rate at which water leaves the plant. And it's what agronomists use to calculate what my irrigation schedule should be. So not only did it know the correct calculation, um, which I did fact check, it's basically a component of um, crop coefficients and reference evapotranspiration rates, which are different for every plant. But it then told me the breakdown of the formula itself and how to build that irrigation schedule over seven days. So if I'm a hobbyist uh, agronomist with apple trees in my backyard, it uses the same type of reasoning or format that you know someone with a PhD in agronomy might use. And this is what we use actually in commercial farms for tree fruit. It breaks it down for me and educates me, but I can go through this and say, write me the irrigation schedule based on, I don't know, it would be bogus dates to demonstrate what that might look like. So here's now gonna print me out an example and it's just throwing in a random figure and it's telling me what that might actually look like over a seven day period. And it estimates that this is only an example. So it gives a proper disclaimer there as well. But I can continue to have a conversation with this. I sent this first last night. So there's no timing out in a query. I can come back to this at any point on the left, continue to ask it questions and say, it still doesn't make sense. Could you explain this differently to me? And it can continue to iterate based on what it wrote because it remembers the prior context of this thread of what you asked it at any point in time. So there's no timing out here. Another example, uh, this is a algebraic problem that's never been solved. For those that uh, really love suspended infinite and infinitesimal paradoxes, it not only knew that it was not solved, but broke down and explained to me why it wasn't solved. Just wanted to see if I asked it something that was unsolvable, how it answer that question, um, and breaking down the argument around that space. I got into Python hacking ideas. So what's five Python program ideas for a hackathon focused on discovering new trends and ideas in social media channels. So if I wanted to have my friends over on a Saturday night for a Python hackathon, because who doesn't love doing that? Uh, now I have ideas on what that looks like, uh, what those applications could be. Or maybe I'm building a portfolio because I just graduated from school. I'm about to have an interview. I could say, show me something that Google might want to interview me on, being able to throw that out. But then I say, write example Python for each of the five ideas. So now it's going to write Python for each of those five Python ideas. So now it gets my hackathon started and being able to throw that out there. 
And at any point I can go and, like I said, continue to interrogate this and revise it, put it in an email, anything your mind can kind of come up with. It creates the term of prompt engineering because it's not so much a limitation of the tool, but a limitation of the person asking the questions. And this is probably, you know, the next great uh, profession to come out there because when a tool is this sophisticated, you have to really be creative and ask questions the right way. Tools like Dolly, for example, generating images based on a similar prompt tool with an open AI. This is a chat bot, but there are tools out there that can generate images. Uh, photography, I just generated an image yesterday around a robot reading a book, uh, but it took me a paragraph worth of prompting in order to get the image just so. Another example of that, raise your hands if you ever did a choose your own adventure game back in the day with the books where you got to choose your own direction. Um, we played a game of choose your own adventure. I said, write the first choice of a choose your own adventure game. It wrote one. I continued to play with this for quite some time. Uh, it threw out the answer. I picked it. It kept track of the storyline, wrote the whole thing out. And we had an entire back and forth, uh, for what seemed like quite a while here. And it did all this on the fly, simply by prompting it to give me the first choice. I went one step further and said, okay, can we get into Dungeons and Dragons? Um, I actually created a character named Carter, who's a human warrior looking for his last love and is a brave warrior and strong. And it actually engaged me and I could go through and do a whole Dungeons and Dragons match uh, with the tool now. Hey, Dan, I have a question in chat about uh, copyright issues. Do you have any uh, insights on that? Because this is completely generated uh, from scratch based on a very large corpus, there isn't necessarily any um, disclaimers around that. Uh, there is a Q&A around what you can and can't use this for. This is a free research preview, um, so there's nothing I'm necessarily paying for it on, but the content itself isn't necessarily tied to what it's specifically pulled from because it's using deep learning to generate it. It's all net new content. The law, as always, hasn't necessarily caught up to what something like this would do. So I expect we'll be seeing more conversation as this evolves. This came out, I think, what, two or three months ago? <clears throat> um, so there's certainly plenty of lawyers asking that very question. If I choose to publish this online uh, as my own work, what, what's the citation for chat GPT? It's based on trillions of different files, documents, text, everything else but all those things aren't individually sorted because this is completely new. It's a learning system. It's not necessarily quoting anything. Uh, it's generating it based on that deep learning model. So TV and there is a, there is a pending issue on the, on the Python code it's been writing as to whether that it, it the patterns follow very much with um, stack overflow code so they use that as a source and there's a little bit of debate going on i think stack overflow is suing open ai over that right now yeah open ai <clears throat> got a very large chunk of money from microsoft that now they're working closely together open ai is being used for copilot which is on stack or, or uh, github actually so one could go into github start typing code it will suggest code based on other code within github OpenAI was the model applied to GitHub, which is owned by Microsoft. So there are GitHub folks doing as well, but their code is being basically used and analyzed for Copilot. Um, so we're starting to see this, this legal space evolving here, uh, but the technology right now is so far to outpace the rules around that. One point to add on there, um, I had done, asked it to do some creative writing examples, similar to what Dan did, like with a poem and a song. And I was trying to test it and I copied the text that it gave me into a few different plagiarism checkers and it came back as original text. So that was interesting, um, particularly probably for the education system if they're trying to um, check plagiarism on um, papers and essays and things like that. Yep, and it, it does not necessarily write the most exciting of text. And uh, so I imagine over time, Schools will get a lot smarter about understanding um, what is and is not, you know, valid for that case. I'd say well, you mentioned Feynman earlier. I mean, the Feynman learning model is more Socratic. Of like, if you can teach somebody something, uh, it shows you have a mastery. And so, one of the questions that's sort of come up on um, so a lot of schools have banned this 
for essays. But why do we even have essays? I mean, if essays are sort of a way for you to summarize the knowledge you've gained, uh, might the experience in the future be that you have a conversation with Socrates on this and allows a young person to sort of interact with Socrates and gain knowledge in that process or in the reverse, have a conversation as one of Socrates' students uh, explaining your position in a in a conversation rather than an essay. So the, you know, while at some levels we're fearful of, oh, you're gonna use this for cheating on essays, it can shift you to a completely different learning model that maybe is better tuned for people learning. I mean, we weren't born 400,000 years ago writing essays uh, and our brains are evolutionarily tuned to, to learn th through means other than writing essays. <laughs> Yeah, so here's uh here's Abraham Lincoln and George Washington discussing cheese. So I mean you can uh pretty much ask it um anything at all around that space. So another example, apologies, my kids knocking in the background. Another example of that is uh being able to post a chat thread. I just found this random online, being able to have it summarize that for me. Um, but then being able to do pretty much anything at this point based on this information. So what do I want to do with that? So not only can it generate things um, out of nowhere, but can also get into, you know, me posting and copying text, being able to manipulate that as well. So we have, yeah. we have a few more comments here in uh, the chat. Trent said that a friend who is a subject matter expert on certain aspects of the farm bill, he asked the chat to write something on an obscure program and he recognized the specific language from USDA briefs. Yeah, so it, it's definitely going to be something where it pulls from that corpus of text. It does. It did learn on something, so it could certainly see where, as time goes on, if I'm asking something very specific, it's going to be referencing that from. Yeah, so we, um, as we think about it, Dan, I don't know if you, I'm not sure where you are on your agenda here, but I think that my my experience using this was really along this term of prompt engineering, where you're staring at a white piece of paper. You hear what GPT, a white screen here, you hear what GPT can do, but you're not quite sure how to tickle GPT to do it. And I would say probably in my first week of using it, there was a lot of me learning how to prompt it, which is a, what's that field called? Uh, oh, what, what field? I'm sorry, the, 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 the area, of, there's a new area emerging prompt called engineering. prompt engineering. Oh, prompt engineering, sorry. And, and prompt engineering is in a sense where in the past you might, you know, I all go back way back into the 80s. We used to write, we wrote a fellow on a PET 16 computer using machine language. And then we moved ourselves up to basic and and now we're up to Python and the, the the level of sort of your evolutionary about how you would program something going forward is really prompt engineering in which you, how you ask the question and give it the specifics of what you want in a particular way. If any of you remember when Google first came out, uh, it took us all a little while to sort of get search right. Like how do I actually search Google correctly? So that's called prompt engineering. And if you start using this, uh, that'll be one of your first challenges is how do I actually ask this? It's almost like playing a game of Zork. It's like, how do I ask this thing the right question so I get the responses I'm trying to do to be productive? Um, so I'm sort of shifting here a little bit. Do you, do you mind helping people understand what, you know, staring at a white box, how do we get going? How do we start at the beginning? So can I can jump in just, just quickly along with that? And I think it's, it, it adds on. <clears throat> We, I, I think we as adults now who have been through our educational programs, we have a knowledge base of information that we, that we can work off of. We're all amazed at this machine that can generate what we find to be valid or seemingly like closely valid answers uh, with some modicum of creativity and ability to cross-reference and, and, um, and generate things in the form of ways. What, what a question I have 
which is, is something to do a little bit with, with what Carter was asking about prompt engineering. Um, future generations that may not have the vast knowledge base that we as a generation have spent a lot of time dumping into our brains for access are now sort of transferring that knowledge, that you know, random access memory into a tool like this. Future generations may not, are, are you worried at all that future generations will not essentially be able to think for themselves? Under, or even, my fear of course is that um, if, the systems like this, you know, being a good engineer. So in engineering school, they don't teach you um, everything about engineering. They teach you how to ask questions, how to know what the right answer should be or what's close to be. You have to have a knowledge of what your product is in order to be able to look at a question and get an answer and know that that answer is correct because it should make sense. If we don't know the answers, we don't know the the yep. real base of the uh, of of knowledge that's generating that answer. We don't know that the answer is correct. You can ask this thing to say, you know, argue, create an argument between George Washington and and uh, and A. Blinken. And since since I have no knowledge to that, I have no idea whether or not what's actually coming out of that is true. Well, yeah, me... so I don't I don't know the exact answer to this, but I, an analogy I'll make is I. As a young engineer, I was working in the F-18 and we were just using finite element modeling. And uh, somebody was trying to figure out a landing gear crack problem. And we were, I was in the chief engineer's office and the team had been working for three months with a finite element model to calculate why the, the landing loads on the F-18 on a carrier deck would cause it to crack. A very, very complex problem. And they presented the finite element modeling, which is a very, very complex set of uh, not spreadsheets, beyond spreadsheets to calculate that. And he said, that, that, that answer doesn't make sense. And he just like wrote up on the board F equals MA and he just stepped through it like through going, it's like, you got a units error here. Um, and it was, it was, a, the engineer was maybe 15 years his junior. There was a units error. Uh, he didn't understand the magnitude of the units error because he was stuck in the FEM. And I think we're gonna have that. I think that there's, a, I'm not positive that, that we have, you know, over time, we've sort of figured that out. Uh, but there is, you know, how many of us know how to use an HP 41C to do calculations for engineering school any longer? We're well beyond that. Um, I don't know how to answer that question, but it's, it's we've faced it before. And I would put it in that same class of problem of generational shift of sort of like, we don't know, we still don't know who built the pyramids, I don't think. I mean, I remember Isaac Asimov running around or not, or uh, a Spock running around in the seventies with a TV show saying that the pyramids were built by the Martians. No there's, there's a concept around transactional knowledge where I don't know the answer, but I know where to get the answer. Uh, GPS is a great example that nobody remembers how to get anywhere anymore, but everyone oh, knows yeah. how to get the answer. I can and, still do range and bearing calculations while sailing, but nobody else can. Maybe can. Yeah. <laughs> and so there's there's definitely a risk. And I, I have parents and friends in education around second or third graders, my five and seven year old who are just listening to pound on the door have a very different sense of knowing things than I do, even knowing phone numbers. I mean, I don't know my mom's phone number. It's in the cell phone. Uh, so I think there's definitely a risk that all that's going away. And these tools are very responsible. You know, they say right here, it will generate potentially incorrect information. They're not releasing this commercially for the next two to three years because they know once it goes commercial, there's no stopping it. And so this is a research preview because they want millions of people beating up on this thing to make sure that when this does go live and it is out there, it's as accurate as it can be that they're considering all the odds. I know when we were at Alexa, the answers that Alexa gave, people didn't question. And so it was a huge burden of proof around how do we make sure it's being asked and doing the right things um, at the cost of holding the technology back altogether. So to some extent, we've lost the ability to say, well, we, we just need people to, to memorize and remember handwriting itself, you know, 
handwriting's going literally down the tubes. So there's the the pace of change and evol evolution, but there's also skills that you know folks knew perhaps 50, 60 years ago that just aren't relevant anymore. Nothing comes to mind at this point, but we have to consider, you know, where we get into misinformation and truth, knowledge. Do I trust Wikipedia? Do I trust this tool? Where does information come from? It's not properly cited. This is now generating completely new things without necessarily citations on it. So it's kind of the next step beyond Wikipedia where I'm now going in and I can ask this, how do I know this is true? And it's say, well, you got to fact check it yourself. Um, so using it as creative prompts, as choose your own adventures, as ways to synthesize information, you know, we, we appreciate it for the context it's in, but this tool is by no means a silver bullet to do the thinking for you. Uh, it's an augmentation, not a replacement. Uh, it's not automating my knowledge and learning. I can certainly use it to learn evapotranspiration, but if that calculation is wrong, I've lost my farm. So it's really up to me at the end of the day to say, this is a great start. Still want to vet it. Um, uh, Dan, can I interrupt for a second? I, I just sort of, uh, for the broader audience, I want to make sure that we're not, uh, there are many topics that we can cover here. Um, I, I would like to enable people to understand just to not be fearful of just trying the tool so we can get feedback on what they see its use. Yeah. You might just sort of imagine that you're the, it's the first time you're starting to use this. You don't really know how to prompt it. You're not a good prompt engineer yet. And you know, for the, some people on the phone that haven't even used this at all, you know, to give them something to do during Christmas if they're if they want to do something if they want to hide, you know, what what is that experience like, or how should they think about just stepping into this and trying a few things out? Yeah, I'd say. But, and, and you mind showing them a little bit just to see how easy the tool is to use? Yeah, I actually want to open it up to the audience um, to throw out a question or a topic or something. And then we can start to shape that into what would be a good prompt for the tool. Does anyone have a topic, an area of interest, a question or something we'd like to go through together on the call? Dan, what if I were a VC and I wanted to um, get an allocation from endowments? Like I'm just throwing one out, like let's say Caltech. And I know Caltech issues an annual report every year. Is there a way for me to maybe cut and paste information from the annual report, dump it in there, and, and try to figure out? Well, why don't we start even simpler? Something like that. Go ahead, Carter. Let's start simpler. Let's start simpler. Like, I, you know, let's take this model. I'm a VC. I'm trying to raise money from an endowment. What, what strategy should I use for raising money from an endowment? There you go. So um, this might be the first question I ask you, but to your point, uh, Chris, you absolutely can copy and paste if you remember those prior articles and be pasting stuff in there. Uh, but hold on, let's prompt, let's prompt Chris a little bit. So Chris, you're you're uh, let's pretend you're a sales guy working for a young venture capital firm that doesn't have a track record, and you read this. Now what do you now what do you say? You you want to sell to this endowment? What's the next thing you're you're like? Oh, this is really cool. Strong track record. Hmm, don't have that. What do you would like? Why couldn't you ask it? What if I don't have a strong track record? You know, or what if I? Why are there that? You know, what about emerging managers? There you go. Here's how to raise money from an endowment without a strong track record. Okay, so now you're thinking about this, Chris. What does that prompt you to think? Uh, I'm not sure who the prompt engineer here is, <laughs> whether it's GPT or it's you. Are you the are you the product or are you the? <laughs> what about asking it? Can you create a list of the top endowments? Again, that's going to be tougher. The the lists. It, it's it not will, for the list, but you could say. It will. I'll I bet you it will. Build the list. I'm sorry. It's better. It's sort of saying like, how would I go about building the list? Got it. But it, I've asked, I've used it to ask for, you know, to give me an idea of who the top such and such are within a particular industry, and it will provide you with some. 
if you I, I, on some of that data be i would recommend you be a little bit careful if it's giving you explicit data because it is an yeah order. It definitely gets you thinking in a way that perhaps you're not, and you're like, oh, that's the path I should be on. It, this is what I was saying earlier, is sometimes my brain gets, oh, there are 10,000 things we could do, and here are the 10,000 things, and it's a little bit better just saying, okay, just calm down a little bit, just like focus on these four, um, and you're probably going to get close enough. I was not expecting to write a limerick of this. <laughs> <laughs> no, was I, but I love it. <laughs> there you go. But Rob, what would you ask next of if you were like trying to figure this out and you're hunting for word capital, what would you be asking next? I one question I would ask, you know, in this is what are some effective means to reaching out to those who make the decision? And it's I would guess that it's going to give, you know, standard prospecting approaches. Networking. That's this. Is you yeah. if you if you add endowments. That's the other thing I've learned with this is if you you add you want to add those extra little clarifications because it will think about it slightly differently. So what I find is useful here um, is getting into areas that I don't know much about. So for example. I look at this list and I say, use your network. Well, I know how to use my network. Attend industry events. Yeah, I get that. Use LinkedIn. I say, tell me how to effectively use LinkedIn. What I think is interesting about that, the way I'm processing that information is that it's actually telling you where to go first, which is the path of least resistance. Go to your network yeah. first, utilize relationships, and then it's got LinkedIn and email You know, as other options, which are, you know, at the end of the day, um, if you're reaching out to somebody for the first time, obviously having somebody introduce you to that particular person is a, a faster path opposed to just sending a cold email. Now, with Dan saying, tell me how to effectively use LinkedIn, you can imagine it's ambiguous at that point. It doesn't know about whether that's for endowments or is that, oh, right. know, I would have asked it differently. I would have said, tell me how to effectively use LinkedIn to attract endowment, university endowments or something. I'd, I'd go like, this is, you know, I'd, I'd go very specifically to see whether it could help me think through that. It looks like it actually used the context of the endowment in the conversation above. It likely does, it does. Yeah, it, you can it see that on point that. number two, right? Yeah. And that, that's really the difference between this and Google. Right, Google, every question you ask, you have to keep appending the context right? Um, or search through things. This keeps the context. It remembers what you asked before, and then it goes and uh, tries to form the answer knowing what you asked recently, um, which is the, the main difference between this and Google, in my opinion, and this is the superpower um, that this may use to um, sort of replace our, you know, our need to Google something, maybe instead let's let's chat about something to find to find answers see now it's even giving you stories so yeah and then the key thing here is how to effectively pull in stakeholders that's going to be generic as we saw but then i said and write five interesting stories that i might use on my profile right and and this is going to be a starting point what i find the tool for me is most useful is then saying, turn this into ideas, turn this into tweets, turn this into a sales paragraph, take away the blank page for me. It's not going to write 40,000 words in a book. It might write the first 8,000 to get me started, the chapters, the title, all that information, but it's up to me to do the work from there. And if Well, you can do it, like, let's build on that for a moment. Let's say, um, okay, we've, we've had this conversation. I'll give you the case and you figure out how to write it. So we've had this conversation. I'm right hiring. No, no, don't leave that case. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I'm hiring five new sales reps to go sell to endowments. And I want to write the training materials to give them the best guide on how to start as a new salesperson to sell to endowments. And I'm going to give it to Rob and he's going to run from there. He's, but I want to give him, I want to write the Wikipedia page in our, in our employee handbook 
to uh, to say if you're a new employee working on endowments, these are the best practices to follow. So what you'll find here is the more detail you give the prompt, the better the answers are going to be. Um, as I mentioned, I generated an image on Dolly the other day, and I had to use probably a paragraph's worth of text to get something specific. So the less specific your question is going to be, the less specific the answer is going to be. Um, and so that's where detail really matters. If you want bullet points, specify that. Someone that has less experience versus more experience you know, it's going to know necessarily if something's really uh, intense or less so. Yeah, that's part of relying on the intelligent for this thing. Um, but being able to hone in and ask clarifying questions as you go on is really going to be the important thing. It's kind of the, the data mining part of this thing. So I can get more specific from here and get into these, once again, spitting out generic answers. Um, if I wanted to go into okay. participate in discussions or then say the creative part, showing me five discussions I could engage in that endowments would care about. If I don't know much about endowments, this could teach me on that um, or make something specific because it knows more about endowments than I do. And so the way we, I've sort of been using it this way to shape thinking or shape approach or to help keep, bring people up to speed uh, and to um, pre-flight even pre-flight, uh, Chris, I've done this from a standpoint of like a sales call is I'm running a venture capital fund. I'm doing this. I have a sales call with this type of person. What, you know, and these are the things we normally say, which points do you think I should emphasize? And it just on that pre-flight, it helps focus your conversation a little bit. And what it's giving you is not, I would not say it's breathtakingly new, but it is, it sort of gets your, your head in the game. I'm like, yeah, I should just concentrate on that. I'm not gonna get, I'm not gonna get distracted and off off base. Um, so I found it very interesting as sort of a a second brain, which I'll tell you what we've been doing. So we've been working with GPT at iSelect for nine months, and we had an observation that we've looked at 4,000 companies that we have not invested in. And there's knowledge in that. There's some entrepreneur that woke up, put their, put their family relationship at risk, jumped off a cliff and started a business and pursued it for two years. And then they showed up at our door and said, please invest in me. And we said, no. So they're on to a good endeavor, but they maybe don't have it right. And we've said that, that those 4,000 startups, there's domain knowledge there about what's happening in agriculture and health tech. And it may not, it's an incomplete sentence. And that body of knowledge, we've got 50 gigabytes of data in there across those 4,000 companies. And we said that body of knowledge represents insight that's not on the web. It's not in anybody's language model. And so we started it about nine months ago, we started on the pursuit of how do we take that, all the Zoom calls we've done, let's convert them over to text. Let's take all those videos that we've done and let's put them into a body of knowledge that's our body of knowledge. And then let's make it so that we can probe that body of knowledge and get inference off of it. And so we've now done that and we've implemented it. We have chat GPT and Slack so we've created a bot called Wilson. And in our Slack instance, we can go to Wilson and say, hey, Wilson, I remember a deal that was sort of like Benson Hill that looks like this. And what was that deal again? I can't remember. And it comes back and says, oh, yeah, it's this deal. Is that what you mean? It's like, yeah. And like, how does that compare to Benson Hill? And it, it compares this way, blah, blah, blah. 
And so it, it helps for us, it's starting to help us take disparate emerging knowledge and, and sort of assemble it in a way that makes it so the human, I call it my second brain, it lets the human sort of connect back to data sets that it has. And it might very well be to really understand the truth. I got to go look at some database or some article, but it's very hard for me to, if I go to our internal search tool and search for that information across that corpus of 50 gigabytes of data, I'm not going to get that, that summary of information. And I'm not going to be able to ask it inference related questions going on. So then the next step that we're thinking is if, if I'm a startup, what's harder, the technology development or the customer development? It's the customer development. How do I persuade some farmer or some doctor to think differently about what they're doing? And now I need to call on them. Okay, well, I understand what technology does. Now I can go out to the world of GPT, bring those two things together and say, if I'm trying to take this technology and sell it to this customer, what are the things I should think about that I should emphasize? And we've even said, imagine that you're selling to an early adopter customer in the farm and you have this new idea that looks like this. What's going to be on Debbie Borg's mind when she hears me come and pitch her on it? And what's she going to say back to me? And so it it starts to tell us, and it's like, oh, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> I got to worry about the cost. <laughs> I got to worry about how she's going to finance it. Um, and so it it starts to help you um, understand that. And, and our objective as we're applying it at iSelect is we're seeing this tool as a way to take that whole customer adoption cycle and, and speed up the word of mouth and speed up the conversation to sort of um, accelerate innovation. So as I was getting further around this thing, um, you get into decisions an endowment would care about I do want to be clear. Wait, one quick thing. If you are, because we're right at the top of the hour, we'll keep going. But if what I would like you to do is if you spend some time on this today, we will share the video. I think we're going to do another one of these next week, maybe for other people. So we're, we're trying to get help people understand what this technology does. So look at the video, share it. We'll send out the credentials for another one of these events. Um, feel free to share it with other people. Go to GPT, show it with your family members, perhaps. <clears throat> if you get some lessons learned on that, share that back with us if you would if you want to mind. We're trying to understand as as more people adopt this, what challenges they're seeing. We're at the far end. We've been working with this for nine months. And so we're interested in what people are just trying to figure out at the beginning. Is it scary? Is it hard to use? Do they not know what to look at at the search box? How do you do prompt engineering? We're just trying to understand people's use because it's like downloading Netscape browser in 1992 and like, I have no idea what the hell a browser is. Um, and the conversations here have sort of shown that range of conversations, but please, if you use the next few days and fiddle with it, let us know either on the LinkedIn posts or the Twitter posts or directly. Um, are there any questions that people have? Was this useful? Absolutely. That's amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. Love it. Yeah. Um, feedback really helps. You know, we have two ears, one mouth, and we've used our mouths today, but we open it up for listening. Um, and uh, we have I, a raised hand here, Carter. What? Hey, Carter, it's, it's William Burns. Um, on, touching on the conversation of digging into your internal documents and databases and all the disparate silos that you have. And how you integrated to Slack? Can you touch more on how you're using the system to engage in that process? All right. Well, it's in prototype stage, but the next step of it. So the first instance we're using is to probe the database ourselves. Okay. Next level, I'm going to be a little coy about what we do because it's actually pretty cool. But it is, I we generally operate on the principle that. Developing technology is not as hard as getting people to adopt technology. And so our next step is to understand 
what the customers want and what they're doing in the marketplace that we can respond to. So while most venture capitalists work on tools that help connect startups with funding, pitch book, things like that, we're focused on connecting startups with customers. And so the next instance of what we're gonna to try to do is to help by using things like GPT and its ability to generate text, its ability to generate Instagram posts, its ability to generate memes, is we're going to try to take the storylines that we're seeing emerge inside these startups, simplify them so that they're better understood in the public, share them in a public space, at scale using the generative capabilities of this to increase the scale of that message and then see how people respond to that message so that we can understand the inroads in the marketplace to help accelerate adoption of new technology. Most of the adoption of new technology is a process of, I was sitting at McDonald Douglas in 1992 and downloaded Netscape and everyone else really didn't start understanding what a browser was until 1995. What if that had happened in three years? If you look at, if you look at the, the um, trade data on Tesla, it is flat for 11 years and then it goes up. For Amazon, flat for 11 years, 12 years, then it goes up. That is all an information arbitrage. And that arbitrage it's not that they have the tech right. That arbitrage is, does the market understand how to adapt? Is Amazon a bookstore or is Amazon a web service? It took 15 years for the market to figure that out. And Carter, so can I add something that might not be clear? I, I think, so chat GPT is built based on GPT technology and they've trained it with their data set. So what we're building is using the same GPT technology and we're training it with our own data set. So just to make sure. That yeah. Everybody so the knows. website um, is just a preview of what I showed today, but you can't actually download this on your local computer and apply open AI to your own data set, as well as augment with third-party data as well. And that's available today. Anyone can download and play with it. If you're a Python developer. You um, probably need a GPU card to get it to work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, hey, Carter. Yes. Carter. To touch on the Amazon Netscape uh, information arbitrage and adoption, what was the difference? Have you analyzed the difference? This is kind of a tangent question, but have you analyzed Apple and iPhone adoption versus the other two examples you provided? Yeah, yeah. We, we uh, I, yes, we, we are students of technology adoption as venture capitalists. We're students of people think that venture capitalists are focused on technology development. We're really focused on market adoption so yes we've paid attention to it and i can cover that more with you later if you want yeah can we use chat gpt to create a summary of what we've done today so we can attach that to the link of this video uh, we sure. will do that we will let's convert this to text let's convert this to text dan and then shove it into chat gpt and ask it to summarize yeah, that's exactly what I was demonstrating in that uh, chat summary is uh, Zoom can output a actual transcript, chat transcript. A lot of CRM tools can do that. And it can go through, as I did with that Hamlet play, and summarize everything that got said, as many sentences as you want. Yeah, why don't you do that and maybe do a blog post off of this? And then uh, if you do do that, do you mind just recording it like on a loom or something so we can show what your prompt engineering is to take this all? Sure. Uh, Eva has the, you have the recording there, so I'll work with you on that. Anybody else have any questions? Um, anyway, it's sort of exciting. I thank you for your time. And, and, uh, and again, uh, just help us a little bit. We'll get this back out in some particular way, but it invites some other people because we'd like to sort of in increase the circle of trust around this to, to see what people think. There is a, OpenAI Discord channel uh, specifically for ChatGPT. So if you want to see examples from people around the world and what they're typing in, uh, it's a fun place to explore and check out as well. This is great. Everybody have a good holidays. Thank you for your time. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Thanks Thanks for the time. Thank you. Nice uh, to see you all. Singularity is almost here. <laughs>
<laughs> right. Say hi to the family, Dan. Thank you. Thank you all for this. Chris. Brilliant.